This conference started this morning. It goes until tomorrow, uh, late afternoon in the evening. There's five to six hundred participants here, all who believe that what we know about science is wrong. What we need is a camera and a lake. You can go out there, look through the camera, do the math, and realize that we see too far. That is the fundamental basis of the flat Earth. Matt Berkowitz, thanks so much for coming on to Talk Beliefs from your home in Canada. You're a statistician and are currently working on your PhD at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. Your YouTube channel, Science Literacy, was founded in 2014 and explores science and the various processes people use to arrive at knowledge. So uh, how have you been, Matt? Uh, has the recent lockdown helped or hindered you in your work? Well, thanks so much for having me, Mark. I can't really complain here relative to many other people's experiences throughout the, uh, the pandemic. Um, Canada, actually my province of BC, responded fairly effectively, at least initially. And we've thus far not had um, very high confirmed cases compared to the rest of the country um, and certainly the continent. Um, the, the lockdown hit just as I was finishing up my master's and it didn't change a whole lot of my workflow. Since I finished that, I've been you know a little less productive than I would have otherwise, but hopefully that'll as I start the, the PhD program uh, that I'm starting uh, next month. So, yeah. Denialism. That's not a word that evokes pleasant thoughts, is it? Who wants to be considered a denialist? I use the word not to insult, but to describe a particular pattern of cognition or behavior. Science denialism is specifically what this video is about, and that's the tendency to reject well-established scientific theories, facts, laws, or evidence. You run the Science Literacy YouTube channel, as I mentioned, so what was it that inspired you to start this project, and what are your hopes for it? Well, I used to be active in social and environmental sustainability activism, which ultimately uh, revealed to me that preventing a great deal of social progress is rooted in bad ideas and that these bad ideas are ultimately rooted in a lack of critical thinking skills, scientific illiteracy, and general ignorance about how the scientific process works. And there's there's no shortage of, of polling data that implicate large percentages of the population in accepting uh, pseudoscientific claims, denying established scientific truths, and embracing conspiracy thinking in service of um, such untenable positions. And you know, there are many good YouTube channels describing certain aspects of science, but not many that focus on the specific tool set required to, to evaluate scientific claims. So if you encounter a claim in, in the media, how should we evaluate it? What process should we use to accept whether the claim uh, ought to be accepted or not? And this is why I began my series with a trilogy on, on what scientific consensus means, how it forms, how it changes over time, whether it can be corrupted, as many people uh, who are anti-science and into pseudoscientific claims um, allege. And then I follow this up exploring the topic of uh, science denialism, what causes people to deny or reject science, uh, the ways in which we recognize when people are engaged in, in denialism. And then I similarly explored conspiracy thinking and subsequently delved into a series on how the peer review system works. So these were foundational videos mostly aimed to um, equip the average person who may not have formal scientific training with the tool set to navigate scientific claims. Um, so for the future, um, assuming I can get my, my act together, I hope to start applying many of these foundational concepts to specific topics. Um, I'm going to touch on a lot of hot topics. So I'm starting with alternative medicine, and I hope to do a series on uh, climate change, GMOs, vaccines, uh, IQ, and other psychometric fields, um, and perhaps other topics. Oh, very cool indeed. Now, today we are going to be talking about conspiracy theories, or rather conspiracy theorists, and why they think as they do. So we've seen a lot of them emerge or reemerge since the coronavirus pandemic hit. It's something you've tackled already on your science literacy channel. But I thought it might be good to revisit the topic and kind of break it down and deconstruct it as best we can. I suppose the best place to start is 
what is a conspiracy theory and what are some of the conspiracy theories uh, out there that you've looked into? Uh, yeah, in my first video on this topic, tagged as 4.1 on my channel, I discuss that there are different definitions of the term uh, conspiracy theory. Uh, so I just noted down here a common definition embraced by, by conspiracy theorists is an explanatory hypothesis that alleges the organization of two or more people acting in secret to plot against the best interests of others. Um, but in popular, uh, popular discourse, as well as in the academic literature, conspiracy theory is more commonly defined as any alternative and unsubstantiated explanation of a particular event that accuses people of plotting against others. So conspiracy theories tend to have a lot of features in common, like secrecy, the involvement of two or more people acting, uh, goal-oriented actions that harm others, and perhaps most critically, lack of substantiation. So on, on my channel, I followed up with two videos, one that looked into actual conspiracies, because of course, uh, real conspiracies do occur. So I focused on uh, Watergate and the perhaps lesser known MK Ultra. Well, that was a series of government experiments that, uh, who, whose legality was very questionable uh, that happened in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, there's still a lot of information is not known about it, but there were a lot of leaked documents in the last ah. MK Ultra often uh, tested human subjects with um, with psychedelic or just illicit drugs like cocaine and other oh, things to test the you know the response of human beings under under severe pressure. And then I did another video that looked into um, two what I call grand conspiracy theories. Um, so the JFK assassination and 9-11 conspiracy theories, uh, specifically looking into the cognitive, the, the common cognitive pitfalls that these conspiracy theorists are entrapped by. And I, I call these uh, grand conspiracy theories because they cause um, large groups of people orchestrating very complex events that require a near impossible level of precision to pull off yes. without anyone noticing. So I think that's useful to distinguish the two. Uh, so for example, one of the major logical fallacies that many conspiracy theorists fall victim to is what's known as selection bias or anomaly hunting, which is when um, conspiracy theorists points out something that doesn't seem to jive with the quote official mainstream story of, of, of the event. Take the, the JFK assassination. Um, one of the best examples that I know of, of anomaly hunting is what was been known as um, the umbrella incident. Right, so um, if you if you look close to the car in which the assassination of JFK took place, there's a man um, standing there in, in a, on a hot day with an open umbrella, and oh. conspiracy theorists latched onto this as though the umbrella man was signaling to the shooter. Okay, now now is the time to shoot, right? Um, and so conspiracy theorists grab hold of these these anomalous events. Uh, it turns out there's almost always some sort of explanation. Um, even if we can't find it. Uh, in this case, they did find out what the explanation was. They got a hold of this guy and uh, got him to testify in front of Congress. And he described how the open umbrella uh, was actually a form of protest of appeasement policies, protesting against the war that was occurring at the time. Um, and that was a common right-wing uh, protest. Um, but, you know, if you don't go looking for that explanation, you can easily use confirmation bias to um, use this anomalous seeming event and describe it in terms that are uh, congenial to the conspiracy theory belief that you want to uphold. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that they did kind of get it right in that they did, did that the open umbrella did mean something. I mean, it could yeah. easily have been, uh, oh, it's hot. I, I usually you know, open an umbrella on hot days. You know, it could have been, and it usually is something really sort of prosaic and boring like that, isn't it? Yeah, I think so, exactly. Other times there's just, uh, it's just a total misunderstanding, you know, like in the 9-11 context, um, there are puffs of air that you can see that escape from the World Trade Center towers as it collapses. And conspiracy theorists have referred to these as squibs, as though they were evidence of explosives going off. Um, you talk to any structural and engineer experts and they'll tell you, you know, this is just compressed air uh, that occurs when a building is, is, is being collapsed. So oftentimes these, these so-called anomalous events are not anomalous at all. They're just misunderstandings. Yeah, and what's interesting about what you say about uh, the, the conspiracy theorists actually looking for uh, looking for meaning in the smallest thing, 
I, I think it, it gives them as a per, as a person a kind of validation that they they do have the cognitive ability to uh, to see through the veil. You know, you can't pull the wool over my eyes. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, and yeah, to go back to this to the psychology and the personality characteristics that drive this type of thinking. That's that's definitely one of the the, the traits that have been found um, that drives conspiracy thinking is that, that sort of feeling of of uh, being in possession of uh, esoteric knowledge that most other people don't. So it feeds into that that desire to be accepted uh, and feel special, which we all need, right? But hopefully we don't go about uh, feeding it through such destructive ways. Okay, now let's see if we can find our way down that route that leads to the conspiracy mindset. So where does denialism begin? Yeah, so it's difficult to say exactly where it begins as there are both proximate and ultimate causal factors. So the proximate factors involve personality characteristics, um, peer groups, um, lack of epistemically rational thinking, meaning we don't have the tools uh, or we have faulty tools to formulate rational beliefs, um, which I think we can discuss a little more shortly. Uh, and the, the more ultimate factors involve evolutionary forces that shaped our tribal psychology, so w which are currently being exploited more, more so than ever, it seems, right now. Um, and when issues become polarized, this is a ripe breeding ground for pseudoscience, denialism, um, and conspiracy thinking. Um, one of the best explanations of denialism that I've heard is by philosophy professor Adrian Barden. He described it as engaging in a kind of psychological projection that is unconsciously to unconsciously mistake the emotional value of denying something for actually having good reasons to deny it. And that's from his book, The Truth About Denials. So, so it's, a, it's an unconscious strategy that's typically deployed as a self-defense mechanism to protect one's, one's core values from being undermined. And when we're engaged in it, we're, we're often in the throngs of what's called motivated reasoning, which is when we attempt to justify um, an emotionally desired conclusion rather than align our views to the, to the best evidence. Right, and emotion comes into it quite a bit, doesn't it? Absolutely. Um, it's, emotion drives into what we ideologically want to be true. Uh, it, it, it causes us to um, double down, dig in our heels. And, you know, we have a whole set of core, core social needs, emotional needs that we're, often, uh, engage, that we're often engaged in unconscious strategies to protect uh, the interests of. And so denialism is, is one strategy to do that. So how exactly does all this feed into conspiracy theories? So conspiracy thinking is often the, the final straw of the denialist in order to resist all the conflicting evidence that should negate the basis for one's denial on a topic. We concoct a conspiracy theory that can supposedly accommodate this dissonant information, often in a way that's unfalsifiable and self-insulating, meaning that all further information is interpreted as consistent with the conspiracy theory and where apparently no evidence could refute it. So it's basically the, the same sort of cognitive mechanism, but it's just further down in the, in the rationalization justification uh, process. Well, I guess the next question has to be, why does this occur? Um, so there's a number of important predictors of conspiracy thinking um, that have been documented in the academic literature. And I went through these in that first video on conspiracy thinking. So briefly, um, uh, their personality characteristics, um, people turn to um, conspiracy beliefs in response to mild paranoia, which is typically accompanied by low levels of interpersonal trust and a belief in declinism, which is the, the belief that the world is, is getting worse. Um, people turn to conspiracy beliefs as an externalizing tool in response to powerlessness, low self-esteem, and life dissatisfaction. And people are more vulnerable to conspiracy thinking when they have very high levels of openness to new ideas and experiences. So there's still a lot of work to be done in establishing whether these correlations are causal, and if so, which way the causation points. So an another driver of both denialism and conspiracy theories involves uh, cognitive biases that we all fall victim to, as well as a lack of epistemically rational thinking. Conspiracy thinking generally relies on a common set of logical fallacies and an unsound epistemic framework. So there are common logical fallacies that, um, that we rely on uh, to reject accepted scientific findings, like shifting the burden of proof, um, the argument from ignorance, right? When we plug our preferred explanation into a hole, an explanatory gap, and then special pleading, where we use information that we wouldn't otherwise accept 
um, in, in different circumstances, but we use it to justify the things we want to be true. Um, and then there's also a number of, of ma main cognitive biases that have been documented in the literature that drive conspiracy thinking. So there's illusory pattern perception, uh, confirmation bias, which probably everyone's heard of, and uh, proportionality bias, which is an interesting one. That's, that's when we tend to think events with huge grand effects also have grand causes. Um, and I'll mention one more deeper cause of denialism and conspiracy thinking, and that's our tribal psychology, which I touched a little bit on before. I know you wanted to ask me about that at some point later, so maybe I'll, I'll pause there and we can, we can come back to it. For anyone who doesn't know what confirmation bias is, that's when you look for incidents and events which confirm your conspiracy theory, basically. Isn't that right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I guess the critical point to drive home about that is I think people often intuitively think, well, I don't do that. I'd be aware. But the whole point of it is it happens beneath the surface. You're simply unaware of it. That's why it's so powerful. Another why would be, why do you suppose that some people lack these tools? Yeah, that's a tricky question. One of the most difficult cognitive biases to reconcile with is what's known as the bias blind spot, where we recognize the role of bias in others, but not in ourselves. Um, perhaps more controversially, there's also a larger cultural issue where much of society exhibits a sort of anti-intellectualism. It doesn't understand or respect expertise and isn't trained or educated to, to think critically. And uh, we're seeing a bit of that now in certain parts of the world, aren't we, uh, in listening to scientists and uh, virologists and so forth with the uh, coronavirus. Absolutely. It's running rampant right now, and it makes sense because there's a high level of uh, uncertainty and fear right now, um, and these issues are being highly politicized. So unfortunately, that all sets the stage for... Um, rejection of expertise, denialism to protect one's own or emotional and social interests and all the all the patterns we're witnessing. Matt, you've spoken on your channel about the tribalism that exists in humanity. Does this explain some of the conspiracy mindset? Yeah, so just to continue the train of thought I was on, the, the anti-intellectualism, the, the lack of respect for expertise and the lack of rational thinking really hurts us when issues are politicized uh, such that rampant partisanship causes opposing ideological camps to be greatly antagonistic and distrustful of one another, which distorts our ability to, to think rationally. Um, things have never been more uh, ideologically polarized in the United States, at least. Um, or at least, I think they're at you know, several decade highs. And people often recognize this ideological partisanship on an abstract level, but when it comes to an issue they're emotionally and ideologically invested in, all bets, all bets are off. Well, if we break it right down, it probably goes right back to our own evolutionary origins. Could these ways of thinking go right back to our earliest ancestors? I think so. Uh, Michael Shermer has coined the term patternicity uh, to refer to our tendency to find meaningless patterns in noise. So in the, in the cognitive psychology literature, this is often referred to, or there's this distinction between system one and system two thinking. Uh, Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winning uh, so, uh, cognitive psychologist, um, he outlined this in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. So, system one thinking refers to our intuitive gut level responses, uh, and system two refers to our slower, more deliberative, uh, rational thought processes. And system one is our sort of default uh, thinking mode, and it, it's very useful in many circumstances because we can't be um, deliberate in everything we do. Um, but it tends to mislead us when, uh, when our intuitions require override, right? And so um, there are many of these conspiracy theories that uh, I think we fall prey to because we're just relying on an intuitive level uh, processing of the information in a way that conforms to whatever needs we have. And we're not actually employing any sort of um, rule in, in statistics sure. or problems or in some other form of, of rational thinking process that would actually lead us to the right answer. Um, and so it's, it's worth keeping in mind this distinction between system one and system two. System one is the cheap, quick way of thinking. System two is the more computationally expensive in terms of our mental hardware uh, mo mode of thinking. Um, and it, system one can mislead us in many circumstances. So this, again, get, cuts at the difference between 
um, the evolutionary environment in which perhaps many of these system one um, system system one processes can lead us to the evolutionarily adaptive um, decision. Uh, but in the in the modern environment, it's it hasn't so much. Um, and many of the things that we need to do to be successful in our modern civilization do require um, much more deployment of system two. And so this led to what's called uh, ecological rationality, which is a specific count of practical rationality that describes how certain heuristics of decision making evolved according to the evolutionary environment. And of course, the evolutionary environment was very little, uh, had, had very little in common to our modern day civilization. So the, the beliefs and um, practices that are adaptive today to success uh, were not in the evolutionary environment. And so there's this mismatch between uh, the biases that we were perhaps evolutionarily tuned for and the ones that consistently mislead us today into making poor decisions and arriving at faulty beliefs. So if we were to sum up everything that's been explored here, how then should we look at someone, say a friend or family member who insists, for instance, that COVID-19 is a hoax or uh, that airplane trails in the sky are the government poisoning us or that the earth is flat? Simply saying that they're crazy or insane doesn't really get us anywhere. So how should we view them? There's no easy answer here. I think I got this from neurologist and skeptic Stephen Novella, which is that there is a little conspiracy theorist inside all of us. We all have the the vulnerability for thinking conspiratorially. And so it, it would be a great idea if we could all remember this, that um, to fall victim to irrational thinking, we don't necessarily have to be stupid. There's a great term coined by uh, Keith Stanovich. He's a, a reasoning uh, researcher in cognitive psychology. And he coined this term dysrationalia, which is when people with the requisite intelligence are unable to think rationally. It's because they've been tripped up by one of the many hurdles that can, that, that can entrap us into uh, leading us down a path into formulating a, a faulty belief. Um, so I think it, it doesn't make much sense to regard these people as beneath us. Uh, these are common um, these are, these are common traps of thinking that we all fall victim to at one point or another. Um, and so I think it behooves us to have compassion for it. Um, in terms of talking people out of these beliefs, the literature is pretty young on that. Um, you know, there's something called inoculation theory, which is, which is more helpful for preventing future conspiracy theorists, uh, yeah, future conspiracy beliefs from, from, uh, from occurring. And that's basically when you, you know, you prime people with the mental tool set uh, to avoid thinking in these fallacious and, and problematic ways. Um, insofar as deconstructing conspiracy thinking once people have already arrived at those beliefs, this is, a, you know, perhaps the, the billion dollar question, right? Uh, I'm, I'm quite privy to um, the, what's been called street epistemology. Um, Peter Boghossian sort of introduced it in, in his first book and talked about it more at length in his, his recent book, How to Have Impossible Conversations. Um, and there's a great YouTube channel um, by Anthony Magnabosco on this. And I, and I really like it. It basically is just using the Socratic method to ask, to ask questions about how people arrived at the beliefs that they have. So you, rather than just countering them with um, different information that should uh, dislodge them from their faulty beliefs, you try to get them to understand the process that they've used to arrive at their beliefs and to um, try to deconstruct all the different reasons they have for for their current beliefs. You're out here asking people what they believe. Is that right? Essentially, yes. Okay. Is one of your goals to have them believe what you believe? Absolutely. Okay. I think so. I, I appreciate so. your honesty. Of course, yeah. I suppose if I thought that I had the truth of the matter when it comes to a God existing, then I would be out here doing exactly what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, and I know there, there's quite a lot of literature to support this, this general approach, uh, but it, it does take a lot of patience, compassion, um, time, and a lot of skill uh, with how to ask those questions. Indeed, and that's exactly how this channel started. Was uh, I didn't know it was street epistemology. I, I didn't even know it was a thing. Um, some of the early recordings I did were with, like, for instance, JWs and Mormons in the street, and a lot of it was asking questions, you know, how do you know that type questions.
Well, Jesus said, as, as Jonah spent three days and three nights in the fish, yeah. so the Son of Man will die and rise again. Do you ever think about those things, those things I mentioned about, you know, walking in water, someone living in a fish, talking to a donkey, do you ever, do you ever actually think about those and go, those are a bit odd? You know what I mean? Do you ever think that? No. Really? And uh, occasionally they would get into arguments, but yeah, the, the best epistemology is when you keep asking questions, isn't it? And sometimes the person you're speaking to will get to a point where they're like, I'm not sure how I arrived at that conclusion. And uh, that's the interesting part, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're unlikely to see it in the moment, um, but I can't tell you the number of times where I've, I posted something online and uh, the person comes back to me weeks later, even months sometimes, and says, you know, that, that really challenged what I thought to be true. Um, and, you know, I think it's because I tried to do it in a more compassionate way rather than just calling them idiots and, you know, trying to debunk them and make them look stupid, um, that people, people really appreciate that. Um, and, yeah, if, if you also treat, it, treat the conversation as one in which you also have something to learn, that you're not just trying to debunk their beliefs, um, people can sense that form of equality in the conversation that you're not just um, you're not just being falsely patient or falsely uh, inquisitive about what they what they believe that you you actually want to learn and you you, mm. you hold out the possibility that you, you could be wrong as well. Okay, that was a really fascinating dive into the psychology of conspiracy theorists, and I'm sure we could have dove even deeper if we had the time. I'll leave links to your YouTube channel and social media in the description below. And all that's left to say, Matt, is thank you once again for coming on to Talk Beliefs. Thanks so much for having me, Mark. This is a lot of fun. I appreciate the time. And uh, yeah, always great. <laughs>